If you have your Bible, find Revelation chapter number 5. We are in our missions emphasis. I want to emphasize while you're finding Revelation chapter number 5 that I gave the first message of this series last week. I was so moved last week. I don't know if I did a real good job tying in the message with the start of our missions emphasis. Our mission theme is every tribe, every nation. You're finding Revelation chapter 5 verse 9. We're actually going to go through verses 1 through 10. Every tribe, every nation. Our particular focus here at Family First is for the children of the world. We're asking God to turn our hearts towards the unborn, that we would reach out to them like never before, as well as the mothers, as well as those in the families that are suffering from the heartbreak of abortion. We're also turning our attention towards those that are caught up in human trafficking, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Do you realize that today, Super Bowl Sunday, is the worst day on the annual calendar for human trafficking activity? Today... In Atlanta, Georgia, there will be more women that are prostituted. There will be more children that are abducted. There will be more people that are forced into that sex sex slave trade than any other day of the year. We are also speaking up. Pastor Meredith talked to you about the movie we're going to watch in a couple weeks, Priceless. This is not an entertainment video. This is not an entertainment movie. This is not popcorn and soda. This is a time to get a message from God in how we can make a difference in these types of things. How many found Revelation chapter 5? Can I see your hand? Revelation chapter 5. Keep your Bibles open. I'm going to move really quick today. This is going to be so fast, it's going to make your head spin. Somebody in the back said, I have to see it to believe it. Well, come on. If you believe it, you might see it. Come on, somebody. Revelation chapter 5 verse 9 says this, and they sang a new song. How many like new songs? Can I see your hand? (laughs) I like new songs, new things, new, new words, new songs, new joys. They sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Our theme for our missionary emphasis is every tribe, every nation. We believe that every person on the planet deserves to hear the gospel message of the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe people from every tribe. Another rendering for that word is the word kindred. That means a group of people bound together by a common descent or bloodline, meaning there's no biological limit to the gospel. It's not only every tribe, but it's every language. Some renderings use the word tongue, a group of people that all speak the same language. So again, there is no language limitation to the gospel. Every people, that's a word that means culture or race, a group of people of all uh, various racial and cultural, even physical or geographical ties, no cultural limitations. Lastly, from every nation, the word is ethnos, ethnicity, nationality. A group of people who have a particular ethnicity or live in a particular country or nation of the world. We believe that every person on the planet deserves to hear the gospel. No national limitation, no cultural limitation, no language limitation, no biological limitation. Every person on the planet deserves to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're getting quiet on me this morning. Now, the quieter you get, the longer I preach. Now, come on, somebody. Give me a shout. Hallelujah in the house today. Let me give you this statement. We believe that every person on the planet deserves to hear an adequate presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ in their own language, which they can easily understand in order to make the decision to give their heart to Jesus Christ should they decide to do so. Are you with me? Every person on the planet Every person that's ever been born has a right. They deserve to hear an adequate presentation. I can't go to Romans, but the book of Romans says, And how shall they hear except there's a preacher? And how shall they preach except they are sent? Every person deserves an adequate presentation of the gospel in their own native language, which they can easily understand in order to make the decision to give their heart to Jesus Christ should they desire 
to do so. I'm preaching this morning for just a little while from Revelation chapter number five. I'm preaching a quick message. We're calling it the scroll and the lamb, the scroll and the lamb. I'm following several bullet point statements. We have the handout sheets. If you're filling in the blank, if you're downloading notes from the U version Bible app, we're going to move very quickly. Here's the first bullet point. Here's a couple fill in the blanks for you. We're calling this the mortgage deed of redemption. Say that with me, the mortgage deed of redemption. I can't fill in a lot of detail, but Revelation chapters 4 and 5 should be talked about as one unit without a chapter division. In Revelation chapter 4 verse 1, John is caught up in the spirit, and that's where we see the rapture, the catching away of the church into the presence of God. In Revelation chapters 1, 2, and 3, we see the church on the earth. The seven letters to the seven churches, which are in Asia Minor, are literal churches, but they represent the church age that has existed all through the time of the church age since the resurrection of Jesus. But in Revelation chapter 4 verse 1, the focus shifts from the earth to heaven because the saints are raptured into the presence of God. And in chapter number 4, the focus is on the throne and the one who is sitting on the throne. There is a great and mighty throne in heaven. And the one that is sitting on that throne is of course almighty God. It is the Father. But then in chapter Chapter 5, the focus shifts from the throne and the one that is sitting on it to the book, the seven sealed scroll and its recipient. Some say that chapter 4 focuses on Almighty God. Chapter 5 focuses on the Lamb of God. Chapter 4 focuses on the Father. Chapter 5 focuses on the Son. So the focus shifts to this seven sealed book that we're calling the mortgage deed of redemption. And you say, Pastor, what is this book all about? Notice what it says in chapter 5, verse 1, Revelation 5. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back. I'll explain that. And sealed with seven seals. We're going to call this book the mortgage deed of redemption. We're going to say that this book represents the plan of God. The heart of God, the will of God to redeem all people that have ever been born on planet earth. It is the message that I'm presenting that every person that's ever been born deserves to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in their own native language to make a decision to choose to give their hearts to Jesus Christ if they would choose to do so and so be redeemed. This book, it's like a story. It's like the message of God. It's the heart of God. And we're calling it this book, The Mortgage Deed of Redemption. First of of all, we find out that this is a continuation of a book that's told about in the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, and by the way, Daniel is the key to understanding the book of Revelation. Daniel says that in the last days, something is going to be released. He's prophesying about the last days. Now, I'm trying to hurry real quick here, but I get revelations that come at me from every angle. And how many know this morning that we are living in the last days? Can I see your hand? How many know we're living in the last days? These are the last days. I'm telling you that for sure. But you know when the last days started? Technically, biblically, the last days started on the day of Pentecost over 2,000 years ago. Joel, the prophet, said, In the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. That was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. So if Acts chapter 2 was the beginning of the last days, we are certainly in the last of the last days. Come on, somebody. If God's eternal clock that represents time and eternity is clicking off by the seconds, surely it is 1159 and 59 seconds with one more click of the clock, one more second of time before we transition from this time into the time that is to come when the church is going to be caught up into the presence of the Lord. So the Bible says that in the last days, Daniel says, I heard something, but I didn't understand. So I said, oh Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up until the time of the end. In other words, this message of redemption, the story of the plan of God to redeem all of humanity, it's in a sealed book. And it's not fully revealed, it's not fully opened and fully explained until the time of the end. 
So when we see the throne and we see this seven sealed book, it is the book that was prophesied in the book of Daniel that would be open in the last days that would explain God's mortgage deed of redemption. We see that this book is like a scroll. You know what a scroll is? A piece of paper in the ancient ways of making a book that would be rolled up. But the interesting thing about this scroll is it's written on both sides of the paper. That was very unusual. Normally only one side of the paper would be written on and when it was rolled up you couldn't see what was on, on the inside because it was only written on one side of the page but in this case it's a scroll written on both sides which would mean that there's a lot more to be told than what could just be written on one side of the page and then it says that it was sealed with seven seals now the importance of this book is seen in its subject matter this book that I like to call the mortgage deed of redemption is God's story of his redemptive work through Jesus Christ for all of mankind. How many know what it means to be redeemed? Redemption. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We sing those songs in church. We've sang them for years. Redeemed. How I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed. And I, I sell. Redemption. What does it mean to be redeemed? Look at this. Redemption refers to the fact that as Christians, we have been bought back from slavery to sin, from slavery to sin, uh, from sin, because we are redeemed. This is obvious in the chapter for several reasons. We're introduced to the Lamb of God. He's one that paid the price of the redemption. But it's also said that we are going to be redeemed. Now, how many know that you are redeemed today if you have the blood of Jesus in your life? You are redeemed. What does that mean? You're bought back from slaves to sin. Jesus said everyone that commits sin becomes the servant or the slave to sin. People say to me all the time, Pastor, I just can't help myself. You know, my flesh wants to sin and I just don't have power over it. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you are redeemed. You are to reckon yourself dead to sin and alive to Christ. My spirit today is fully redeemed. I'm no longer in a debtor's prison. I'm no longer a captivity to my own passions, desires. I am redeemed. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Spiritually, I am redeemed. But how many know <laughs> there's a part of redemption that is still yet to come? Let me illustrate this for you. Paul talks about it as the redemption of our bodies. Even though my spirit is fully redeemed, my body has still got a little ways to go. And I realized that this morning when the alarm clock went off. Now, I'm not messing with you. I know some of you are early bird people. Some of you are morning people. Some of you are not morning people. I understand that. But when the alarm clock went off this morning and it was time for me to get up and get showered and get real handsome so I could come over here and speak to all you fine people, my spirit wanted to leap out of the bed and say, glory to God, it's Sunday, hallelujah. That's my spirit man. But my flesh man, that's the one that's not yet redeemed are you with me he's the one that's wanting to say these covers are feeling pretty good right now why don't we just hunker down and push s-n-o-o-z-e three or four times on the alarm clock so even though we are redeemed spiritually there is a part of our redemption that is yet to come. You say, I'm not sure I understand that. Well, listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said, Luke 21, 28, when you see all these things come to pass towards the ends of the age, he said, you are to straighten up and raise up your heads because your redemption is drawing nigh. How many know we're closer to that than we've ever been? Come on, somebody. That's good news for somebody. <laughs> That's good news for you S-N-O-O-Z-E-ers. <laughs> That's good news for ones that are having a little bit hard time letting the flesh man come into alignment with the spirit man that is already redeemed. But redemption is that when we are delivered from slavery to sin by the redemption of God. But in order to understand the context of this scroll, this mortgage deed of redemption, look at this. There were three things that are taught under the laws of Israel in the time of Moses that could be redeemed. Number one, a man could be redeemed. If there was a man that was sold into slavery, he might have the privilege of redeeming himself. 
If he could get the finances, if he could get the wherewithal, he could redeem himself by himself out of slavery. Secondly, a wife could be redeemed. If a man died and uh, he left behind a widow and she had no brothers who would normally under the Jewish law would have been given the responsibility to take her as their wife, take her under their care in her household, and they would take care of her in honor of her brother. If she did not have a brother that would do that, there could potentially be a near kinsman, had to be the next in line biologically, had to have a bloodline, also had to have the finances and the wherewithal to be able to take care of her. A kinsman redeemer could step in and redeem her. If she had debts, he could cancel them. If she, her property was mortgaged, he could pay off the mortgage and he could redeem it. That's exactly what happens in the book of Ruth when we find out that, uh, or in the, that we find out that Boaz was her kinsman redeemer. He was a near relative and he could redeem Redeem her from the debt that she incurred when her husband passed away. But then thirdly, land could be redeemed. But the problem here is this book, this mortgage deed of redemption that's going to tell God's story, that he's got this wonderful plan for every person on the planet. This book is sealed. This book is all sealed up like a scroll. And it's got seals on it, meaning it's, it's secret. And nobody has the ability to open it. Nobody has the ability to just unveil it. The, the seals would represent the requirements, the price, the stipulations that would have to be met in order for this book to be able to be read. And so verse number 2 of Revelation 5 says, And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice a question, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals. And then the very next verse says, No one in heaven and on earth or under the earth was found that could open this book. A desperate search was made. Is there anyone that has the ability? Is there anyone that has the credibility? Is there anyone that has the spiritual wherewithal to unseal this book and to display God's miracle plan of redemption for all mankind that's ever been made? A search was made and no one on earth could do it. No one in heaven could do it. And the scripture says no one even under the earth. That's a technical term meaning the underworld, the world of demons and devils and demonic spirits. No one was found that had the qualities that would permit them to open the book and take off the seals and read God's plan. How he wanted to forgive the sins of every person on the planet. And so that's why it says in verse number four that John... It's writing here. He says, I begin to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Now, I want you to get this picture. This is one of the most dramatic scenes in all the book of Revelation. We've got a book. Let's say I've got a book right here. And, and this book would say what God's plan is for every one of you. This book contains God's plan to help Steve and God's plan to bless Naomi and God's plan to redeem Butch and God's plan to provide for Cesar and everybody else, everyone in the room. This book contains God's miracle plans and his plan of salvation, redemption for your life. Amen. The problem is the book's all sealed and nobody can open the book because we, we have not paid the credentials we, we don't have the ability we have not been the one designated to open this book and so John is is looking he said this is a sad sad day you know why it's so sad because everyone in this room we desperately need a savior Amen. we cannot save ourselves I want to thunder this as loud as I can. I know that we live in a culture and humanism is now expanding at a rate beyond what it started in the 70s and the 80s. The me movements, the personal movements, it's all about us. The, the selfish movements that are all happening in our culture today. No matter how smart, no matter how brilliant, no matter how rich, no matter how prosperous, no matter how accomplished we might be, there's not one person 
on the planet that can save themselves because every person needs a savior. Every person needs Jesus in their life because we are a debtor sold into a debtor's slave prison. I can't take time to explain this, but Jesus went into a parable to explain that not only do we not have the ability to pay the price, we don't even have the right kind of currency because the bill can't be paid with the stuff that we possess. If we think we can pay it for money, I'll get more money. It doesn't take money. We say it takes more talent. It's not the commodity that God is looking for. Some people say, well, it takes good works. So I'm going to work hard. I'm going to try hard. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to do more penance. Those are the not the commodities. Those are not the things that God is looking for that would pay the price of the mortgage deed of redemption. So John is weeping because nobody has the ability to open the book of God's wonderful plan. And then verse number five says this. One of the elders said to me, weep no more because the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered and he (laughs) can open the scroll and it's seven seals. John hears one of the elders. Now I can't take a time, but there's 24 elders in this chapter. They represent the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles of the New Testament. So what we've got is a picture of the plan of God in both covenants. We've got the nation of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel representing God's Old Testament covenant. We've got the 12 apostles of the New Testament representing God's miracle plan of salvation in the New Testament. We've got the foundation of all the kingdom of God and one of the elders said to John, I've got good news for you, John. You can stop weeping because one has been found. And behold, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the root of David. He's conquered. And that'd be a good place for somebody to give a great big shout of praise and hallelujah to God. Because he has the ability to open this book and reveal to you and I God's plan of redemption. Now, I've got to teach for just a minute. So here's a nugget for you. Where was he at all the time? Where did they look? A search went all through the heavens. No one on our heaven in heaven could open the book. The search went through the earth. No one in the earth could open the book. They even searched under the earth. No one under the realm of demonic uh, evil spirits had the ability to open the book. So where was Jesus all along? (laughs) Get a hold of this. There's one place they forgot to look. They looked in heaven, he wasn't there. They looked on the earth, he wasn't there. They looked under the earth, he wasn't there. Because all the while, they forgot to look at the throne. Because he was sitting on the throne. The Bible says that to him who overcomes, I will give him to right to sit with me on my throne. Even as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He wasn't in heaven, he wasn't in the earth, he wasn't under the earth. Because he was sitting on the throne. Oh, come on somebody. And he says, if you overcome come by the blood of the lamb you will rule and reign throughout all eternity as a king and a priest to god most high i'm not going to preach my kingdom culture series right now i'll put the whole thing here in a nutshell but you'll rule and reign with jesus christ forever because you are a king and a priest to god most high and you can be the person that god ordains you to be sitting on the throne with jesus forever looking at his credentials what's it say he's the root or let me back up he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. You know what that means? He's the legal descendant to the heir of the throne in Israel. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, how many know the Bible says in 1 Peter that your adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour? Key word, as. The devil is not a lion. He's just a wannabe lion. Come on, somebody. Let me just park right here for a minute. How many give me five minutes to encourage you? He's not a roaring lion. He's not a warrior. He's not the king of the jungle. He does not have the ability to conquer you. He just wants you to think that he can. Because he's not the roaring lion. He is as a roaring lion. Jesus is the king. He is the king of the jungle. He is the roaring lion. Can I tell you something real quick? What is a group of, I know the answer to this, but I'm just trying to get you to listen. What is a group, somebody help me, when you've got a bunch of lions? You know, I, I know you've got like a, a covey of quail. 
I'm from the Midwest. I'm a quail hunter. We've got, yeah, yeah. Some of you wouldn't go through the, uh, yeah. You've got a herd of cattle. You've got a covey of quail. You've got a school of fish. But you've got all, but you've got a pride of lions. And in that pride of lions, there's always one dude. He is the king of that tribe. Are you with me? Because somewhere through his lifetime, he has won that designation. He has proven that he's the strongest, he's the toughest, he's the quickest, he's the fiercest. And all of the other would-be competitors bow to his authority because he's the king of the jungle. When he roars, everybody listens because he has earned that right of authority. But what happens to lions? Just like happens to people, they get old. Go on, turn to your neighbor and say, it's happening to you. Go on, go ahead and tell them that. I know it's not encouraging. I didn't say I'm going to give you weakness and stupidity today. I said I'm going to give you strength and wisdom today. Turn to them and say, no, I wouldn't recommend saying the old gray Mary. No, 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 just, just don't say that. If you do say it, don't blame the pastor. But we're not quite as young as we used to be. And what happens when we get older? Our eyes don't focus quite like they used to. Our ears don't hear quite as keenly as they once did. And even our, our teeth, sometimes, we have to get dentures. We have to get false teeth, you know. So that happens to lions just like it happens to people. Now, I want you to see this picture. Here's the devil... He at one time was the king of the jungle, but Jesus pulled his teeth out <laughs> by conquering him on Calvary. He took away his voice. He took away his authority. His, his claws are no longer keen and sharp. They're brittle. If he tries to claw at you, his claws will probably just break off because he doesn't have the strength and the skill that he once had. But the one thing he's still got is what? A big mouth. He can still roar a big roar. And he roars at you. And in reality, he can't hurt you because his claws are brittle. He's slow as Moses. He's not swift and sharp. And besides that, he's got no teeth left in his head. You know, he's like grandma. He just, you know, just All he can do is try to gum you to death. Just get that picture. Everybody has a grandma with dentures, right? Just relate to that. And, and there's grandma's dentures. on the. Uh, I walked into the bathroom one night years ago. Oh, it was the most horrible experience. I was a teenager. I walked into the bathroom, and there they were on the countertop. It's grandma's dentures in the, in the jar of water. I just about had a heart attack right there. I didn't know. Man, what is that? stuff in the jar on the countertop in the bathroom. It was grandma's dentures. But there's the devil. He can't hurt you. All he can do is try to gum you to death. But when he roars, what's happening? You turn and you run in the other direction. And this is a fact of nature. The pride of lions uses this to their ability. They'll put that old, tired, worn out, former king of the jungle out and he'll roar a mighty roar. And when the deer or the antelope or the, pre uh, the prey, when they hear his roar, they're turned and they'll run in the other direction. And what happens? They'll run away from the roar and they'll run right into the clutches of the younger, stronger, more fierce lions that will take them down. So instead of running from the roar, what do you need to do? You need to run to the roar. I thought I'd just throw that in there because Jesus is the roaring lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the root of David and he has triumphed. He is the conqueror. And then it says in verse number six, I got to hurry here. It says in verse number six, and between the throne and the four living creatures among the elders. Now, what was John looking for? Come on, track with me. He's looking for a lion, right? He's looking for a fierce warrior. He's looking for someone that has the ability to open this book. Someone with great strength and skill and power and, and ability. He looks for the lion. But when he turns, what did he see? He saw the lamb standing as though it had been slain. I want you to get this picture. He's expecting to see the lion, the king of the jungle. 
mighty and fierce and conquering, a warrior, lion-like being. But instead he sees the lamb as it has been slain. He sees a, lo- a lamb still bearing in his body the marks of the crucifixion. His hands that were still wounded. Jesus said to Thomas, put your hand in my palm and see the prints of the nails. Take your hand and thrust it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Jesus today, I want to tell you, is still a scarred Savior. Now the wounds have healed. Don't feel sorry for my Jesus today. He's not a wounded warrior. Come on somebody. I don't mean that in a bad way. He's completely healed and he's ever with whole. But the scars are still there. Can I park here for a minute? There's some of you that have went through battles. There's some of you that have had people take a bite out of you. They have hurt you and wounded you. And you needed a respite. You needed a place of healing. You needed a place of recuperation. But you need to realize that you have been healed by Jesus. And the bleeding has stopped. The pains have ceased. And now you need to realize you're no longer wounded. You might be scarred, but you're not wounded. You're not going to go through the rest of your life in in fear and in intimidation because, oh, I had a hard time and I've never gotten over it. i got a word for you today. You need to get over it. Somebody say, Pastor, do you have a word for me today? Yeah, i got a word for you. Get over it. Go on. Put the past behind you. If you were wounded, then take your wounds to the cross and let the blood of Jesus heal you and get up from the altar and say, I'm not wounded anymore. I'm healed by the power of God. I might be scarred and I might take a memory into my future and everybody might be aware of the pain that I went through but there's no longer any bleeding there's no longer any bleeding there's no longer any contusions on my life I was wounded but now I'm healed and I'm stronger than I was I'm smarter than I was I'm fiercer than I was I'm a greater warrior than I was because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world oh I don't want to offend anybody but how long did it take Jesus to get out of the grave It only took Jesus three days to get out of the grave. He is lifeless. He is listless. Physicians would say he was probably literally bloodless. Jesus' body bled out out on the cross. But in three days, he got out of the grave and he went as a mighty warrior. Some of you have not gotten over what happened to you 30 years ago. You're still talking about it. You're still whining about it. You're still complaining about it. Here's my word for you. Get over it and move on and realize that the power of God can forgive you and set you free from the past and give you a future that's as bright as the promises of God. Some of you didn't even deserve that because you didn't pay enough money, but that's all right. I give it to you anyway. That's a joke. That's a joke. That's a joke. Sometimes I get tired. I say jokes that are probably in good taste, but that's all right. Everybody love me still? Two people. Sorry. I'll never come back. Well, you're lost. But Jesus did what? He took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And it says that the four living creatures and the 24 elders, verse 8, they fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden foals full of incense, which are the prayers and the praise of the saints. And then they did what? They sang a new song. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you redeemed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. There was one called Jesus. He was worthy to open God's seven sealed book, the mortgage deed of redemption. And he says, I've got news for people from every tribe, regardless of who your ancestors are, regardless of what bloodline is in your life, regardless of what nation you live in, regardless of what language you speak, regardless of what culture, regardless of what color your skin is, there's a plan of redemption that God can forgive and forget every sin you've ever committed. And that's why we are taking this time here at Family First to say we believe every person on the planet deserves to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in their own language to make a decision to choose to make Jesus Christ the Lord 
of their life. You know only the one thing that's required? It's not about a language. It's not about a culture. It's not about a bloodline. It's not about a nationality. What's it about? It's about a decision to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Revelation, and I'll close. Pastor Meredith's going to slip up. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17 says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And then it says what? I love this. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life. I love that word. Whosoever will. Say it with me. Whosoever will. Say it again. Whosoever will. You know what that means? Whosoever will exercise his will. Whosoever will say, I choose today to make Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. Doesn't matter what color my skin is, what language I talk, what my heritage is, my culture, my ethnicity, my nationality, my political party, my my level of intelligence, the level of my education. None of that matters. The only thing that matters is I'm a whosoever will. And I'm exercising my ability today to make a decision to ask Jesus Christ to be the Savior and Lord of my life. I believe every person on the planet deserves the right to make that decision. I don't think it's right at all that some people in America hear that gospel message over and over and over and over and over again. And some people in other parts of the world have never heard the name of Jesus not one time to make a decision for Jesus Christ as the Lord of their life if they were desiring to do so. That's why we must take this gospel to all the world as a witness to all the nations that every tribe and language and people and nation have the right to have a personal relationship with Jesus. We're going to close with something else here in a minute. I just want to warn you. I want to share with you in a moment the fact again that what will happen later today, Super Bowl Sunday, is probably the biggest day on the calendar year for the atrocity of human trafficking. And I'm going to pray about that. We're going to call that to your attention here in just a minute. But with heads bowed and eyes closed today, I want to ask every person in this room, do you have in your life a personal relationship with Jesus because you've made the decision to ask Jesus to come into your life. You said, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm in a debtor's prison, but I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I ask you to come into my life. I ask you to be my Savior and my Lord. We had people in the early service this morning make that decision for the very first time to ask Jesus to be the Savior and the Lord of their life. If that's you, can I see your hand all across this room? Pastor Coates, I need to ask Jesus today to be my Savior. Yeah, there's hands going up. God bless you. You can put your hand up. Then just slip it right back down. I need to ask Jesus to be the Lord of my life. I need to ask Him to be my Savior and my guide, my friend. Come into my life. Forgive and forget every sin I've ever committed. Just give me a relationship with you. Because I want to love you and be in eternity with you forever. How many have already done that? Can I see your hand? Come on, lift it up real high. Wave it around. I've done that before. Jesus is the Lord of my life. Isn't that a wonderful thing? I've been praying today for family members, loved ones, friends that need to have a relationship with Jesus. And if that's you, if you'll just ask him to come into your heart. Ask Him to be your Savior. Ask Him to redeem you by His great ability. He'll come into your life. He'll change you forever. And you'll live in eternity with Him, which is the most amazing, amazing experience. Redeemed. I'm redeemed. How about you? Aren't you glad you're redeemed? Can you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. I want to close, and our ushers are going to help us this morning. This is out of the ordinary for us, but I thought we would do it at this moment. I want to show you a video. This is two minutes long. I want to give you an opportunity to respond. I think what we're doing today is a spiritually, prophetically significant thing because, as I mentioned, there are people today that will be abducted. One of the most horrendous days of the calendar in America for human trafficking. 
children that are abducted, women that are brought in from other countries that are taken from their settings and they're stuck into this slave uh, trade, this human trafficking sex trade slave system that is so very much prevalent more than what any of us ever realize. And do you know that Tampa, Florida is one of the hubs in our nation for this type of evil activity? I want you to watch a video. It's two minutes long. It's by a lady that I've known for 30 years. Her name is Cara Marroquin. And she's American, but she's given her life to minister to people in Central America, Latin American countries. And she's going into these countries and she's raising up a, 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 a way to help people not get trafficked, not get captured, not get processed through this evil, evil thing. I want you to watch this video and I'm going to give you an opportunity this morning to give in a tangible way to her and the ministry and we'll just take whatever you give today and we'll just pack it up and we'll just send it right to Missouri to Carla Marroquin. How often do you see another person as an object rather than a human? Interpol says that women are the new drug. Sex trafficking is obtaining someone through force, fraud, or coercion to exploit them sexually. It's the darkest of humanity. Over the last 10 years, Roughly a third of slaves imported into the United States come from Latin American countries. My name is Carla Marroquin, and I'm executive director for Protect Me Project. We are a nonprofit at work in countries of origin to prevent commercial sexual exploitation, which people know as sex trafficking. Our focus is prevention ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Compassion compels you to rescue, but we've got to prevent. And so we launched Protect Me Project in 2010 to get there before the trafficker, to back that up, find the root causes, the push-pull factors, what pushes people out of their homes, what pulls them like a magnet toward the trafficker and makes them vulnerable. Protect Me Project is more than a mass media ad campaign. We are in person, on the ground, present in the community, making a difference every day. We're working right now in six countries. My goal is to reach all of Spanish-speaking Latin America by 2020 with Protect Me Project teams, mobilized, making it happen. Sex trafficking is an issue that we all have to be aware of, whether it's protecting ourselves or our children, or being vigilant that our neighbors are protected. If you'd like to know more about that, you can look her up at facebook.com slash protectmeproject, also a website, protectmeproject.org. My heart is very moved, it has been, as I know you were, for those that cannot speak up for themselves. The unborn, in a mother's womb should be a place of safety. Also, ladies that should never be abducted, should never be taken beyond their will and forced to be servants at someone else's financial benefit. So anything that you give today, go ahead and come, fellas. We're just going to pass this on. Don't me If you make out a check, just make it to the church. Cause all we're going to do is just to put it through our account, write one check, and just send it straight on to uh, the Protect Me Project. This is our mission's emphasis to reach out for people that cannot reach out for themselves. Go right ahead, fellas. Just allow the people to share today. And I want to tell you how much I love you. I appreciate you today. I want to tell you uh, that I'm so thankful for every one of you being in my life, the opportunity for me to speak the Word of God into you. And uh, I want you to know that God's plan and your purpose for your life is to redeem you so that you can walk in His anointing his encouragement, his strength all the days of your life. Father, today, bless the people. I ask as they go today that they go in encouragement, that they go in love, that they go in the strength of the Lord. 
They go knowing that, Jesus, you did everything possible so that every person on the planet could experience this miracle that we call redemption, being bought out of a life that we were controlled by sin and forgiven and restored into our place in the house of our Father. We bless you. We honor you today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you now as you go. We love you much. Have an awesome, awesome day in the Lord.